Hello, I'm Stuart Maluma with AARP California. Thank you for joining our Teletown Hall today to talk about elder financial abuse. In a moment, you'll hear from experts from across California, and you'll have a chance to ask questions on this important topic. Joining us for today's conversation are California State Treasurer Fiona Ma and California State Assembly Member and Chair of the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee, Committee Adrian Nazarian. Following their brief opening remarks, we will then hear from other experts on elder financial abuse. Our guests will share important information and answer your questions directly on this topic. But first, let me share that financial abuse can take many forms, ranging from investment scams, bogus lottery schemes, stolen jewelry, to identity theft, credit card misuse, and forged checks. Sadly, most perpetrators of financial abuse aren't strangers. The National Center for Elder Abuse reports that 90% of perpetrators are family members or people that the victim knows well, such as neighbors, friends, or caregivers. In today's conversation, we hope to provide some insights into common types of elder financial abuse, answer your question, and provide tips on how we can protect ourselves. To get our conversation going, I'd like to invite our special guest, California State Treasurer Fiona Ma, and California State Assembly Member and Chair of the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee, Adrian Nazarian, to share their insights on elder financial abuse. Treasurer Ma, would you care to go first? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, and I am sitting here with my father uh, listening uh, to this teletown hall, so I'm glad that we're all able to get together virtually uh, during this pandemic, and I hope that everyone is doing well. Uh, first off, um, I was very honored to sponsor a number of different bills uh, last year relating to the Master Plan for Aging, uh, most specifically SB 611, Caballero, uh, dealing with affordable housing, AB 1287 by Assemblymember Nazarian regarding a coordinated system of care uh, and information, AB 1. 382 by Assemblywoman Aguiar Curry regarding family caregiver support. Uh, and I think there's a lot of focus on uh, uh, older adults and how to better address a coordinated uh, care system. Uh, and even the governor, Governor uh, Gavin Newsom, in his 2019 State of the State, committed uh, to develop a master plan for aging. And he followed that up by creating a committee uh, on June 2019 through an executive order, and they finally released a report uh, January 6th of this year, 2021. So I think there is a uh, commitment uh, from our state elected officials and the governor to create a more integrated, coordinated system for older Americans. However, uh, mm -hmm. this issue of scams and abuse and fraud is an issue that I am constantly uh, tweeting about and warning folks about because there's always something new out there trying to hook in uh, folks who are homebound or on the computer or, you know, still reading uh, a lot of mail that comes to their office, um, their home. So I'm very uh, thankful that Assemblymember Nazarian and AARP and other groups are here today co-sponsoring this very important um, conference. My father, like I said, he's interested in learning, even though he thinks he knows a lot of scams, and I do warn him about uh, a lot of them. There are always new ones popping up because people are just, you know, creative, and they're just out there uh, trying to defraud um, older Americans. So thank you all for being here, and I look forward to a very productive town hall today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Treasurer Ma, and uh, welcome to your father. It's um, really, really um, inspiring to hear all the legislative work that's happening behind the scenes to address this issue. Let's turn to Assemblymember Nazarian for your um, opening comments. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you to uh, AARP for being a leader in this space and for lending your expertise to facilitate and outreach uh, for this incredibly important issue. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. And I uh, wanted, wanted to say thank you to my uh, colleague as well and friend, State Treasurer uh, Fiona Ma. You always uh, bring a great deal of enthusiasm, talent, and skill to 
everything that you do, and uh, and you also have the staff to match that and rise to that level as well. So I thank you all. And um, some some months ago, you had brought this issue over to me, and so I very much appreciate joining you and partnering with you along with AARP. Uh, to everyone else on the call, thank you for giving us your time today. I do hope that this is uh, extremely informative to you, and welcome to all of you. I also would like to thank my staff, as well as the staff of AARP and everybody else who's been involved in putting this together, as well as the panelists who come to this with a great deal of expertise. Um, in my own learning about financial abuse, it has been become very clear that this is one of the greatest issues facing all of us, and COVID has exacerbated that issue. I mean, under COVID, we've seen increased numbers of isolation uh, among our older Californians and increased risk of their abuse of all kinds. Uh, financial health is directly linked to overall health. And as uh, a legislator, as well as a son, as well as uh, a member of AARP in just a few years, a few short years, um, I'm, I'm very committed to ensuring that we have practices in place and the laws that reflect it also uh, in order to help protect our seniors. I, I just want to make an anecdotal comment and, and just to, uh, offer you a statistic that when you look at California's makeup, seniors 60 years and older make up about 12 to 13 percent today. But we are forecasting that number, and we've known it for some time now, that it is going to grow to roughly about 25% in the next 10 to 15 years. That is a very quick growth. And as you can imagine, everything that you're going to today directly relates to how all those scams will increase as the population grows and to what extent there's going to be an increased cost to all of us, not just the seniors, but the entire state, in these increased activities as well. So uh, please do pay attention. Uh, anecdotally, I wanted to share with you also that I marvel at how targeted solicitation letters have evolved and advanced over the years. I keep a lot of them that arrive to my house or my parents' house just to kind of keep a watchful eye of how these solicitation mailers are changing and to what extent they're extremely duplicative of you know, government entities and sound very authoritative as well. Uh, and when you have parents who, uh, you know, my mother is uh, caregiving to my father who is, uh, uh, dealing with Alzheimer's, and uh, you can just imagine if he's been the one handling all of the finances for a long time, and now he can't, she's going to be doing most of that, and she looks to her children to help. And uh, and and if we're we happen to not be there, which we always are, but in certain cases, most elderly folks don't have, may not have that benefit. Uh, you can just imagine how much more this will be on the rise. So um, I thank you all for your participation and uh, look forward to a meaningful uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Treasurer, Treasurer Ma, as well as Assembly Member Nazarian. Now, before we jump into our first discussion, let's begin with a little poll on um, to see where you are on, on this um, issue of elder financial abuse. Here's your poll question. What experience have you had with elder financial abuse? On your telephone keypad, please press 1 if you have personally been a victim of elder financial abuse. Press 2 if you know of someone who's been a victim of elder financial abuse. Or press 3 if you have neither been a victim or know of anyone who's been a victim of elder financial abuse. And while the system tallies up uh, your responses, and before I turn to our guests for comments, allow me to tell you how you can ask a question and share your stories during today's interactive conversation. If you'd like to ask a question at any time during this call, just press star 3 on your telephone keypad, and you'll be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and your question and place you in queue. The sooner you
you press star three, the sooner you'll be on with our guests. And now, without further ado, let me uh, introduce our guest for the first portion of this interactive conversation. With us is Lisa Narenberg, who is the Executive Director of the California Elder Justice Coalition. Thank you for joining us today, Lisa. Lisa, um, here's a question that I have for you. We know that um, elder financial abuse is an incredibly complicated issue that you and your colleagues at the California Elder Justice Coalition have been working on for many years. Can you set the stage for us to help us understand what it is and what needs to be done to stop it? Well, sure, Strat, and thank you. Hi, everyone. And as Stat said, this, I'm with the California Elder Justice Coalition, which is a network of 80 agencies and individuals that was started to provide a voice for older victims and for those who serve them. And financial abuse has been a top priority for us. And so I really want to thank Treasurer Ma and Assemblymember Mazarian and AARP for hosting this event and really sound the alarm on a scourge that's devastating so many lives. And also, I really want to thank you both for uh, the work that you've been doing on the Master Plan for Aging. It's really exciting. And I, I also want to acknowledge the courageous people who told their stories in the testimonials that you posted as part of this event. They're incredibly powerful, and I think they really expose what victims and their families face. There's a, a Woody Guthrie song with the lyric, some will rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. And I'm sure Guthrie couldn't possibly have imagined the myriad technologies and methods that thieves are using today. And that's computers and mobile devices and the internet and tracking technologies. And legal instruments can also be weaponized. Powers of attorneys and trusts and deeds and insurance policies, even Medicare, and you're going to be hearing more about that. And that's what really makes this problem so complicated. It's why some communities have started what are called financial abuse specialist teams or FASTs. And the point is to educate service providers so that we can stay ahead of or at least not too far behind the abusers. And they include groups like forensics accountants, experts in dementia. We also need banks and financial advisors involved. Those are the folks that are really on the ground. And I know you're going to be hearing some more people from those professions today. So how big a problem is it? Well, most experts agree that somewhere between 3 or 7% of seniors experience financial abuse. But if you add in scams, the figure is significantly higher. To understand abuse, researchers look at risk factors, and that's who's likely to abuse and who's likely to be abused. Really, just about anybody can be a victim, although people who have disabilities and rely on caregivers may be at greatest risk if the caregivers have access to their homes, their papers, information about their finances, and they can also have quite a bit of influence over the person. And people with cognitive impairments are obviously more prone to be tricked or coerced. And we know that people who are in declining health or who are grieving can also make really good targets. So some of the experts have distinguished between different types of abusers. There are predators. These are the folks that deliberately, knowingly seek out their victims. And some of them are actually in other countries. They even operate as part of uh, organized crime rings. And then there are opportunists who see a chance to abuse, and they go for it. And there are even some who don't necessarily understand that what they're doing is wrong, or they rationalize it. They may think, well, mom probably wants me to have this anyway. So a lot of effort has gone into tracking down and punishing offenders, which is really critical. But there's been a lot less attention to what victims want and need, and that's something that we at CEJC have really been focusing on. So what do victims want? Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that most of them want to get back what they've lost, whether it's homes, savings, their good names, their trust in other people, relationships, because some people lose relationships as a result of this. 
Now, one of the survivors who told her story for this event said, it crushes your soul in describing what happened to her. It crushes your soul. So experiences like that don't just go away. Many people need help and support over, over time. And it's really wonderful that we're seeing a few communities here around the state that have started support groups to help survivors deal with some of the fear or the humiliation or the isolation that they experience. And also to help them, uh, to prevent them from getting sucked back in. Because a lot of times, uh, once somebody has been victimized, they're targeted by others. So some victims also need advocacy with creditors or getting help, uh, getting public benefits or new housing or help recovering their losses. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of help out there for people unless they can uh, afford to uh, get a private attorney. We're seeing more and more cases being handled through the criminal justice system today thanks to really tenacious and innovative prosecutors like Paul Greenwood, who you're going to be hearing from later. But unfortunately, cases that don't involve a lot of money aren't likely to be prosecuted. And that's true even though a relatively small loss can be really devastating to someone who's just hanging on. You know, it can mean eviction or not eating or going without medication. And so this really is an equity issue. Now, even when defendants are ordered to pay restitution, it's usually up to their victims to do what they need to do to collect it, which isn't easy. Abusers often don't have the money or they hide it. And very few communities have shelter or temporary housing for victims who've been evicted or abandoned or have other emergency needs. And so we really need an all-hands-on-deck approach to this kind of abuse, and we need innovation. You know, some have suggested things like expanding the role of small claims courts for smaller losses. Vermont has a model restitution program that pays victims what they're owed up front and then operate like collection agencies to track down funds. We also really need a lot more a free or affordable legal assistance to help people avoid abuse or recover what they've lost. And we also need to explore things like mediation to also achieve those goals. So I think we can all agree on how hard it is to recover losses, which is why prevention is so important. And you're going to be hearing today about programs that really focus on, on prevention, that warn people about abuse and about scams. But I think we also need to acknowledge that some people take out bad loans or they get scammed because they really need cash for emergencies or, or just to get by. And so we need things like safe, affordable, or subsidized loans uh, for emergencies so that people don't feel pressured into uh, taking out untrustworthy loans. We also need programs to help people who have dementias like Alzheimer's who don't have trustworthy people in their lives to help them manage their money or make decisions for them if they need it. So we need more, more daily money management and more public guardians. And there's been a lot of uh, criticism of conservatorship, and it's true that we need better protections. We also need alternatives because conservatorship can be a very blunt instrument. So we need ways to tailor help to meet specific needs by people who have cognitive impairments while still making sure that their rights and their freedom are protected. And I could go on and on uh, talking about the different things that we need, but if you'd like to know more about financial abuse or about CEJC, uh, please feel free to visit us on our website at elderjusticecal.org or follow us on Twitter at elderjusticecal. And again, we applaud you for holding this event, and I want to just end by saying that uh, California Elder Justice Coalition really stands ready to help however we can. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for sharing that very informative um, presentation. Um, I think some really good takeaways, um, a really good understanding of victim's perspective and some of the innovative needs that we need to um, help address the issue. Well, our polls are now closed, and um, here is uh, where mo how most of you responded to, to our poll question about what your experience has been with um, elder financial abuse. So 31% of you 
have personally been a, have personally experienced elder financial abuse. Thirty-eight percent of you know of someone who's experienced elder financial abuse, and I would say a lucky twenty-nine percent of you have neither experienced or know of someone who has uh, elder financial abuse. And now for our second conversation, I'd like to welcome our panel for a discussion on how to safely participate in the financial world virtually. In the financial world virtually, joining us for this discussion are Laura Sykes, who represents the California Bankers Association. Mitch Friedman, CPA, representing the California Society of Public Accountants, and Mickey Nozakia of Senior Medicare Patrol. Thank you all for participating in this important conversation. Laura, let me let me come to you to kick off us uh, to kick us off um, in terms of what are you seeing out there as uh, some of the red flags in, in your work, um, and then also talking about COVID. How do you see COVID playing into um, making this more difficult for um, older, vulnerable populations? Absolutely. Well, as the Chief Risk Officer for American Riviera Bank, I thought I'd first start with some regulatory background on preventing elder financial abuse. Um, under California law, banks are actually considered mandatory reporters of suspected abuse against older Californians. Um, we're also supposed to have these programs in place for detecting red flags that might indicate potential abuse. Um, there was a recent study done by the American Bankers Association where they reported that 56% of banks surveyed throughout the United States host community outreach and education events like the one you're attending today. According to the survey, older Americans, primarily those born before 1964, hold 70% of all deposits, so it's really critical that we know how to watch for these red flags. Um, as part of this Elder Financial Abuse Prevention Program, California law requires that our frontline staff be trained to recognize these red flags for financial abuse and that our employees be trained to report suspected abuse to Adult Protective Services. Um, some of these red flags would include things like uncharacteristic financial decisions, such as a client executing a power of attorney when they have historically done their own banking, uh, or maybe requests for withdrawals for large sums of money in a secretive manner. Um, changes in spending behaviors might also indicate an issue, such as a late-night ATM withdrawal using a card that was never previously used to withdraw cash. The customer might also suddenly acquire new acquaintances or new roommates that accompany them to do their banking. Speaking of COVID, unfortunately, if social isolation is preventing relatives and friends to regularly check in, it's much easier for strangers or even caregivers to step in and befriend an older person for their own financial gain. Um, it's important in this regard to know what to watch for. So I thought we would chat a little bit about some common scams that we're seeing reported. Um, first of all is charity fraud uh, and requests for money that often follow major disasters, and those disasters lend legitimacy to the request. Examples might include relief for victims of natural disasters, or even now, scammers claiming to be raising funds for COVID relief or for vaccinations. We continue to receive reports of imposter scams, such as people purporting to be the IRS or law enforcement claiming that you owe money to avoid going to jail. Scammers may also pose as UPS or online realtors such as Amazon, indicating that shipping costs must be paid before the item can be delivered. Unfortunately, sweepstakes and lottery scams are also still common. I actually worked a case a few years back where the client was convinced they'd won $3.5 million in a sweepstakes, including two BMWs that were going to be delivered to their home the same day the local sheriff paid a visit to attempt to help them. They had told their banker that the payments they were making were to help an alleged friend in Mexico. So obviously, as we previously discussed, these, these fraudsters are getting so good at crafting uh, these mailers and, and giving you the backstory um, so that the banker doesn't suspect anything. Ultimately, the clients confessed that they had believed they had been making tax payments on the prize money, which obviously never came. In addition to scams committed by strangers, we see caregiver scams where someone trusted to care for an older person is taking advantage. Now, banks train their tellers to watch for customers who appear to be under duress or who are being coerced into withdrawing money from their account. Or maybe comments are made about property that is suddenly missing or about account statements that are no longer being delivered to the house. 
Sometimes the client is voluntarily giving financial reimbursement in exchange for care or even for companionship. In cases like these, Adult Protective Services can't typically intervene unless it appears as though there's some sort of threat to the health or safety of the older person. It's important for us to be able to highlight these dangers in such cases. Maybe bills for basic necessities aren't being paid, or medication costs, or, or heat or other utilities aren't being paid, or the client may even indicate that they're at risk of being evicted because they're unable to pay rent. These are all red flags that, that our frontline staff needs to be aware of um, that might indicate that someone is taking advantage of them. Now, despite all these rising threats, it is possible for all of us to safely participate in this virtual world. The, the great thing about having a bank relationship is there are laws that protect you um, if money is uh, stolen from your account. Um, there's a couple of tips that we wanted to share that you can be aware of. First of all, never fall for a request to send a wire transfer or to purchase gift cards if you receive that via email or, or really via any means. You'd be amazed at how legitimate scammers can make these requests appear. They point you to fake websites. They might provide you with fake invoices for goods um, and other things. Don't click on links in emails or in text messages. The simple act of clicking can allow fraudsters to take control of your computer or possibly even steal your online banking usernames and passwords. Never give out your card numbers or your personal information over the telephone. And don't respond to online ads for loans, such as reverse mortgages. As we talked about previously on this call, if you're looking to get a loan, there are legitimate op options. So talk to your banker about what those options might be. And finally, we do encourage people to sign up for online banking. Use direct deposit to receive regular monthly payments and deposit all your other checks via the bank's mobile app. You can also leverage your bank's mobile banking app to set up account alerts for larger transactions. Using mobile and online banking, you can actually review your account transactions daily. And the good thing about filing uh, reports quickly is if you do file claims with the bank for transactions you didn't authorize, you may be eligible to get that money back. If you haven't been able to recover these funds, there are definitely mechanisms to report the scams. Report scams and fraud to the FBI and the Federal Trade Commission, along with some of the other sources that we're going to be providing to you two today so you know where to go. When in doubt, call. Having a banker you can call when things don't seem right is critical, especially during times like these where you aren't able to visit the branch in person because of social isolation orders. But even in a socially distanced environment, we can find ways to help. Remember the old adage as well, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Thank you very much, Alor. That was a lot of real great information. Um, let me come to Mitch um, at the California Society of Public Accountants. And um, I know Laurel touched on a number of these, but let me ask you, are you seeing in your environment or through your agency any new scams targeting um, vulnerable older adults emerging? Well, as, as has been said, Strat, uh, the, uh, the, the fraudsters are getting smarter and smarter. And uh, while I don't want to sound as if I'm scaring people, uh, anybody can end up uh, becoming a victim. Uh, I am as careful as anybody could be. And I once was victimized uh, by a, an email that came from the uh, California uh, uh, automatic toll system. I had been on a road and I thought I had paid the toll, but I got an email that I didn't. And it just seemed right to me, even though I was skeptical. And I clicked, and lo and behold, my computer was taken over. Um, we, I, I was skeptical to start with, uh, and so we were able to make sure that uh, my computer was cleansed and, and there was no uh, damage done. But you can be victimized by individuals who are uh, targeting you not only in a shotgun approach, but in a very personal approach. Uh, I'd like to first uh, give a little bit of background. The California Society of CPAs, through its personal financial planning committees and its uh, financial literacy committee, uh, both uh, get involved with 
elder care issues and uh, financial elder abuse issues, and it's an issue that we know a great deal about. Uh, in, in addition, about 25 years ago, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, in partnership with the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants and the Australian Institute of, uh, of CPAs, uh, had a task force uh, that operated for 15 years to try to understand issues that were related to older adults. And... Uh, why did we start doing it 25 years ago? We saw the coming tsunami of uh, baby boomers who were going to be reaching their retirement age, and we wanted to find ways to understand the issues they were going to deal with and find ways to protect them. A client of mine who's a well-known blogger on accounting issues, uh, he wrote a blog post two weeks ago, and the title of it was, there should be a vaccine against scams, fraud, and financial elder abuse because, indeed, it is epidemic. And uh, you've heard others say it's a scourge. Uh, whatever, whatever definition you want to have, uh, it is, indeed, a problem. Now, I have seen some new scams and an increase in a more standardized scam. Uh, the one that really uh, surprised me, and I started seeing it about a week ago, was what I've described as the jump, jump the line scam. And that's where you get a call uh, from someone who promises that you can jump the line uh, and get your COVID-19 injection by paying a fee. Now, anybody who has tried to get their injection knows uh, it's very difficult to be able to uh, get it uh, because there are just most of the time no appointments uh, available. And so people are taken in by that. The other scam that I'm seeing uh, an increase in is what I call the grandparent scam. Uh, and this really is a, an effective scam where somebody calls and says, Grandma or Grandpa, I'm in trouble, or my car broke down, or I'm in jail, and uh, I need money, and, um, and the person on the other line often says, who is this? And uh, the perpetrator says, don't you recognize my voice? And the, the victim then will say, Bill, is that you? Yes, Grandma, it's me. Uh, I really need money. And uh, it doesn't work all the time, but frequently it works frequently enough, uh, particularly with people who uh, are in ill health or may have some declining uh, cognitive ability that they can become victimized by it. So uh, those are two of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm finding that are relatively new. Uh, we also have red flags that we look for in our relationships with our clients. Uh, we tend to have relationships that go on during the year. They're not just once a year. And we, we, we know our clients, we understand them, and we might be able to observe changes in behavior, which might be indicative of uh, 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 the beginnings of a loss of a cognitive ability or Alzheimer's. Uh, so we, we, we look for that. Uh, other things in the financial area, and some of these things have been mentioned uh, before, if we see sudden changes to a client's beneficiaries of retirement plans or, or life insurance policies, it's a red flag. Uh, and there are many, many red flags. Not every red flag means that there's something wrong, but they just mean it, it, if you see something like this or if we see something like this, we want to uh, look into it a little bit more to see if there's a pattern. Uh, if we see new uh, authorized signatures on bank accounts, that could be a red flag. If we see title changes to uh, automobiles or, uh, or residences, uh, that could be a red flag. If uh, an older adult uh, gets a new mortgage, a uh, mortgage refi, particularly a cash out mortgage refi, that could be a red flag. Changes to uh, or alterations or new powers of attorney. Uh, may also be. Uh, we tend to uh, get very involved with our clients' finances, and oftentimes 
um, we might see changes in credit card charges that are not consistent with the behavior that that individual has had in the past. Also, if we question a client and we, and we get evasive answers or confusion, it's something for us to look into uh, a, a little bit more. Um, one of the biggest problems when it comes to uh, trying to prevent financial elder abuse is isolation. Uh, individuals who are isolated in general can become victimized for a, a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's just loneliness and wanting to talk to somebody who gains the uh, older adult's trust and, and then can perpetrate a, a crime. Um, also, if there are new best friends uh, uh, for the uh, victim, or uh, the new best friends are residing in the house. That's another red flag we have. I could go on and on and on uh, about yeah. the kinds I, of red flags there are. There, there definitely is just a whole um, a whole bevy of them, I would say. And um, just the way fraud is today, you know, if it's profitable it will soon happen. If it's happening in one part of the country and if it's profitable over there, it won't be long before we see it happening in, in our neighborhood. So there really, is, um, uh, there really is an importance to keep on top of these things. Thank you very much for sharing um, your experience. Before we go to our listeners and take their questions live, I want to give, um, I, I want to ask Mickey one question, uh, Mickey Nozakian with the Senior Medicare Patrol. Uh, we know that scammers are targeting Medicare. What do we need to know and how can we protect beneficiaries from becoming targets themselves on this issue? Thanks, Pratt. You are so right. The scammers are targeting Medicare and Medicare beneficiaries. It's called medical identity theft, which means the scammers and the fraudsters Trick you into disclosing your Medicare information. You know, the, the numbers and the letters on the red, white, and blue Medicare card. And then the scammers use your Medicare number to steal money from Medicare. We lose billions of dollars every year to Medicare fraud, waste, and abuse. That's our taxpayer money. Worst than that, though. If a scammer uses your individual Medicare information, the fraud goes on your Medicare record. Now, let me give you an example of a fraud scheme that's happening every day across the country. Someone telephones you and says they're calling from Medicare, and Medicare says you're eligible to get a free back brace. And all you have to do to get the free brace is give them your Medicare information. Now, this is a scam, but people do fall for it all the time. And if your Medicare number is used by a scammer, it can result in you not being able to get the health care services or the medical supplies that you really need, that you paid into. So the message is Medicare will never call you or email you or text you and ask you for your Medicare number or your Social Security number. They already have it. And with COVID, oh, my gosh, fraud is even worse. Now that we're in the midst of a pandemic, the scammers are using the fear and the confusion around COVID-19 testing and especially the COVID-19 vaccines. Scammers will tell you that if you pay money, you can be put on a priority list to get the shot. This is a scam. All across the country, Fraudsters are preying on people because we're all so eager to get our coronavirus vaccinations. So please watch out for scams such as a stranger demanding money from you in exchange for making you a phony vaccine reservation. 
or you see a Craigslist ad for the vaccine, or you get an unsolicited telephone call where the stranger tells you that they will give you a vaccine at your home at no charge. Or you see a text message to set up an appointment for a vaccination, but they first ask for your credit card. All these are scams. Medicare has already paid for the vaccinations. There is not going to be a cost for the vaccine. So you should not be asked for money to be put on top of the vaccine list. And know that no one from the government or your county health care agency is going to call you to obtain personal information from you in order to receive the vaccine. And you won't be solicited door to door to receive the vaccine from legitimate sources. All of these are scams. So here are three tips for you to know so you don't fall victim to the fraudsters and the scammers. Number one, protect your personal information. Don't give out your Medicare number or your Social Security number to anyone other than your own health care providers. Only show your Medicare card when you go to your doctor's appointments, if you visit a hospital or a clinic, or if you go to the pharmacy. And while we're talking about Medicare cards, we're already getting reports about scammers who are calling people and telling them that there's a new plastic Medicare card. Don't believe it. It's a scam also. Number two, detect. Detect fraud by reviewing your medical statements, Medicare summary notices, or explanation of benefits from your health plan. It's like checking your bank statement to see if all the charges are ones that you actually made. And make sure all the health care services and the supplies on your medical statements are the ones you really received. And lastly, report fraud. If you find something suspicious on your medical statement or you think Medicare information has been stolen, report it to senior Medicare patrol. Our California toll-free hotline number is 855-613-7080. That number again, 855-613-7080. Or look on the internet for Senior Medicare Patrol. One more thing. Medicare is complex, and it can be very confusing. So I want you to know that there are trusted sources where you can get accurate and timely information about all things Medicare. The information is free and local. They're called HICAPs, H-I-C-A-P, and there's one in all the counties in California. The high cap can be reached at 800-434-0222. And if you miss those numbers, I know they're going to be posted on the Treasurer's website and the social media. So I want to thank you, and please stay safe out there. Thank you very much, Mickey, for sharing that, and also to Lauren as well as Mitch for um, sharing um, your insights. It's now time to, for us to go to the line and take some of our listeners' questions live. I'm going to start off by um, inviting Josie from uh, Valencia, and she has a question about, um, well, uh, about her, her friend's son. Hello, um, Josie, are you with us? I'm here. Hello, please. Thank you for being with us. Please go ahead and ask your question. 
Okay, thank you for taking my call, first of all. Um, my question is regarding a friend of ours. He's an older gentleman. He's been put in a retirement home, in a care facility. Um, but he feels that his son uh, tricked him into signing a uh, power of attorney. In turn, he has cleared out all his finances, all his bank accounts. He's taken over his properties. And this man doesn't even have a dime in his pocket, and he feels that he's been taken advantage of, and he has lost everything, and just doesn't know what to do about it. How? And he's always calling us, and we don't know what to do. Like, who do you go to to help him understand what's going on, or maybe resolve some of these issues? It, it's just me, so sad. I'm sorry. A man who's all his life for his retirement and, and so on, and now he finds himself in a retirement home without a dime in his pocket. He doesn't have any any resources. He doesn't even have his driver's license. He has nothing. Thank, thank you very much for sharing that, um, Josie. I'm really sorry to hear what um, your, your friend is experiencing, and I'm glad that he has somebody like you con- um, trying to find some resolution for him. Well, um, Laurel, M- Mitch, Mickey, any um, advice or direction that you can provide, Josie? Well, first of all, this is this is Laurel. I know that um, under California law, there are mandatory reporting requirements um, for suspected abuse, and it would seem to me that the, the best place to start would be um, for the retirement home to file with Adult Protective Services on behalf of your friend um, it's, it's not going to be, you know, fast and furious, but it can start the investigation going and hopefully get him um, some help. Thank you. Uh, would you, would Mitch or Mickey, would you also care to weigh in? Yes, this is Mitch. Um, it, w- it was mentioned a, a bit earlier in the presentation about the FAST, the uh, uh, Financial Abuse Specialist Teams. And um, as I recall, Orange County, California, was the first community in the country to develop a fast. Um, If there is a fast in that uh, uh, area, contact them because they have members who are in law law enforcement. Um, This is a very sad case. uh, Because in order to try to get restitution, it could break up a family. But quite frankly, uh, somebody has started breaking up that family anyway. And uh, unfortunately, the adult children are very frequently the perpetrators of the crimes against the older adults. Uh, But adult protective services absolutely is a place to go or a local fast. Thank you very much. Uh, Mickey, any um Additional comments or thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, well, um, every, every, I think everything that Laurel, everything that Laurel and Mitch said is absolutely correct, and I do believe that um, the gentleman is in a nursing home. Most of the nursing homes do have a long-term care ombudsman, who is kind of a bridge between uh, the people in the nursing home and the administration. I would suggest they seek out the long-term care ombudsman in that facility who can help you get the appropriate resources that you need. Thank you very much. I really hope that um, that that can help Josie and and her friend. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star three on your telephone keypad and um, you can come on live to talk to our special guest. Let's take one more question uh, before we move on to our second panel. Um, This next question comes from Daniel, uh, who is in um, Sherman Oaks, I believe, and um, he wants to know about, um, I guess, help from the police. Um, he may not be getting some help from the police on an issue of um, elder financial abuse. Hello, Daniel, are you with us? Yes. Uh, actually, I'm calling about my sister. I'm sorry, there's a bit of a story connected with this, but um, the bottom line is that the system, whether it's been the district attorney's office, the police, uh, the elder abuse uh, that I have, people I have dealt with, uh, the bottom line is that they are not able to really help her. My sister is bipolar. She's 70 years old. 
she really hasn't been able to work much. So my dad, before he passed away, was uh, able to put her in a house that was something for me to keep up for her to be able to live out the rest of her life. Uh, someone moved in with her, uh, we weren't aware of it, and began after so many years to abuse her. She cleared out, in essence, her bank account. Any attempts to go through the elder abuse, when they sent out a caseworker, the caseworker wrote a, a lengthy report about how she had been abused, referred to her condition now as PTSD, that was sent to the Burbank police, and they did nothing with it. I then called the district attorney's office to try and see if there was some chance of recovery or something we could do. The individual then proceeded to file restraining orders against her. I had to hire an attorney to, in order to and move her out of the house uh, in order to until the case came up, then got a restraining order against him. He claimed tenancy. All along, the system kept on supporting the individual who had never physically abused her but had financially abused her. When I try talking to people about this, they say the system is not really geared to dealing with some, anything in terms of abuse except physical abuse that something like financial abuse becomes much more difficult. Then I, when I called a private attorney, they were not able to help me because they said we would need proof uh, that, uh, of, that he has money now and that he could pay her back. Uh, I, it's just been a, a living nightmare. I finally got him out of the house, and the house needs an extensive repair before I can even move my sister back in. Uh, I guess my question is, it really seems to me from my experience that we are not really dealing with the issue of elder abuse, nor are we very helpful or understanding of how to deal with it. Has that been other people's experience? Dan, this is Mitch, a very sad story indeed. Um, and unfortunately, your experience is not uh, all that rare. Uh, it, frequently, uh, financial elder abuse uh, takes second place to actual physical abuse. Uh, additionally, it is often the time, time that uh, when it comes to law enforcement uh, they, and prosecutors, and we're going to have uh, 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 somebody on the panel a little bit later, but oftentimes elderly people particularly if they've lost their cognitive ability or have poor health, do not make great witnesses. And uh, it really, uh, it becomes very difficult to, to be able to prosecute. Things are changing. Uh, as I say, financial elder abuse is out of the closet now, but it is still a problem. Uh, and there's also the lack of resources on the part of law enforcement to deal with these issues. It's very sad. Thank you, thank you very much for jumping in there, um, Mitch. Uh, let me give um, Laurel as well as um, Mickey a chance to see if they want to add anything to, um, to Daniel's um, situation before we move on to our next panel. As, as Mitch mentioned, mentioned I, don't, I, I don't know that there's a whole lot that we can recommend that hasn't already been discussed. Um, again, just continuing to report and continuing to use all channels. I know that following this event, there's going to be links to all kinds of helpful resources where you can get the reports filed and get them in. Um, but, but it is not something that, that happens um, fast. And unfortunately, one of the struggles we see in banking is when you've got somebody with some sort of mental impairment or cognitive issues, um, the challenge is making sure that anything that they sign or authorize is done prior to them being deemed to not be um, mentally fit to, to sign the documents. And it, it just, it's a catch-22, and I wish I had better, um, better solutions to offer. Thank you very much. Um, Mickey, I'm, I'm sorry, um, 
any additional comments or on this? Oh, no, it's, it's a it's a horrible situation, and I wish I could add any value, but uh, other than what our other speaker said, nothing. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for those questions. And um, if you just joined us, allow me to reintroduce our conversation. Um, my name is Chat Maluma, and this is a uh, with the AARP California State Office. And this is a Teleton Hall brought to you by AARP to talk about elder financial abuse and how we can protect ourselves against it. Joining me now for our final conversation on identifying abuse and moving forward are Carol Rose uh, from the Sacramento Adult Protective Services Financial Abuse Specialist Team and um, San Diego former, uh, the former San Diego Deputy District Attorney Paul Greenwood. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. So um, l l let's start off with you. From your perspective, having prosecuted such crimes, um, uh, as um, elder financial abuse, it's often referred to as the crime of the century. Would you characterize the, the, the situation that way? I, I do agree with that assessment, and uh, thank you for having me today. Now, I've been doing investigations for almost 20 years, and financial abuse has been the fastest growing type of abuse reported to Adult Protective Services since the recession. And in the past year, financial abuse reports have made up about 20% of all of our cases. Now, the important thing to remember about financial abuse is that it cuts across all incomes, all socioeconomic levels, and all cultures. And no one's immune to um, any kind of financial abuse. So when we talk about financial abuse, we're talking about the taking of financial resources and the abusive use of financial control by a person in a position of trust. That could be your power of attorney, that could be uh, family members, caregiver, anyone of that nature. Now, elements of financial abuse include uh, numerous things. And so typically we see an older adult who owns property and this property has been taken from them. With Adult Protective Services, we see it across the gamut. This can be a bank account, the property can be real estate, vehicles, cash. We've seen our older adults uh, relieved of their artwork, so the artwork has been taken and sold. We've had cases with, uh, in our more rural areas, maybe their um, herd animals have been taken, so maybe their cows, maybe their horses. So financial abuse looks uh, different um, in, in various areas in California, right? So the intent with financial abuse is to take the older adult asset, and these assets are not used for their best interest. Typically, undue influence is involved. Now, our older adults are more vulnerable because they tend to have more wealth, and they may not know that they've been financially abused. So, for example, we currently have a case uh, where an older adult is illiterate. And she and her husband are very reliant on the granddaughter to manage the funds. And this granddaughter has um, taken all of the money out of their savings account and won't provide any information on how she's spending the monthly income. And as someone mentioned earlier, um, some of our older adults are vulnerable because they may live alone or have few social content contacts. Now, I previously mentioned undue influence, and undue influence and manipulation is very common in our financial abuse cases. Uh, for example, in the case I just mentioned, the caregiver granddaughter has also threatened to harm the older adult if any changes were made to those bank accounts. And the older adult is very reliant on the granddaughter to manage all of the finances. She doesn't have any other family that can provide her or her husband any assistance. So if you've ever had a pushy boyfriend or girlfriend, that is what undue influence feels like. Now, the changes that are done are not typically done with reasonable care, and that's because the older adult is often being pressured by the other party, and that other party typically has the upper hand. When we're talking about indicators of financial abuse, I believe a number of the other speakers already alluded to maybe bills not being paid, a new best friend, very unusual spending patterns. For example, right now we're seeing quite a few transfers um, with peer-to-peer -peer cash applications. The younger love interest, which 
harkens back to our sweetheart scams that I think most of us are aware of, or a sudden change in wills or power of attorney documents. A number of the reported financial abuse allegations that we see um, have been spoken about already by our other presenters, and that includes the grandparent scams. A number of COVID-19 scams, I think someone mentioned the hopping the line scams, um, registration scams for the, um, for the vaccination. Over in Adult Protective Services, we're seeing a lot of property rental scams. Again, the peer-to-peer -peer payment platform scams, and those have included like PayPal, Zelle, Venmo, and Square. We've also seen interesting scams involving Amazon Prime. And with that scam, the victims will receive a spoof email. So the email appears to be from Amazon, and they're asking for an immediate um, payment in order to keep the account current. And they're usually threatening to shut the account down if they don't receive payment right, right away. And we know that with the pandemic, a lot of folks are relying on online shopping right now. So that creates just this added level of pressure and fear. Now, we've spoken a lot about our problem today of financial abuse. And let's talk a little bit about some solutions. And we can help solve the problem by knowing who to contact for help. We have numerous resources here in California for older adults, and locally our office has had really wonderful success in working with legal services. They've been instrumental in protecting assets for our clients. Um, for example, with legal service intervention, we were recently able to stop the sale of a client's home. Uh, some of the folks you may work with in your area could include your local law enforcement, your local APS office, your district attorney's office, financial institutions, your primary care provider, maybe the Superior Court for assistance with restraining orders. Again, we work with our local law school's legal clinic, and you may have other legal services available in your area. And some things to remember about protecting yourself would be to please use direct deposit, keep your checks in a safe place and do not sign blank checks, review your bank statements monthly, Seek advice before giving away money or making large purchases or large investments. Never give out your ATM PIN or your credit card number. And be cautious about adding someone to your account. Both account holders have equal access to the account, and the power of attorney on an investment account does have the ability to change beneficiaries as well as withdraw funds. And in closing, let me say that no one need be embarrassed if they or someone they know is a victim of financial abuse. And this can happen to anyone of any age, and there are so many resources out there to help. Please contact your local financial institution, local APS, law enforcement, or someone you trust if you're concerned. Now, in a moment, I'm going to give you a phone number for you to use if you'd like to report abuse. All reports are anonymous, and Adult Protective Service social workers are prohibited by law from disclosing the name of a reporting party. And as you know, there are 58 counties in California. All of them operate independently. To report abuse, please call 1-833-401-0832. And when prompted, enter your five-digit zip code to be connected to the Adult Protective Services in your county, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Carol. So before uh, we move on to Paul, let me just remind you, if you'd like to ask a question at any time, just press star three on your telephone keypad and you'll be connected to an ARP staff member who will take your question. The sooner you press star three, the sooner you'll be on the air to talk to our experts. Before we come back to your questions on the line, let me put this question, well, let me welcome Paul as well as um, ask, um, so Paul, from, um, I guess from your legal perspective, having uh, prosecuted these types of crimes for some 22 years plus with the um, San Diego District Attorney's Office, would you also see this as um, the crime of the 20th, uh, 21st century? Would you also um, characterize it that way? Well, thank you, Strat, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, may I just also add my uh, appreciation to Treasurer Ma. Uh, to your staff, particularly, uh, I want to give a shout out to Noah Starr, who's uh, helped organize this, to Assemblyman Nazarian and AARP uh, for all your help in all this. Um, yes, there are many indications that this could be called the crime of the 21st century. 
Um, I, um, I have seen over the years a dramatic increase in the number of reports, in the number of victims, and in the different opportunities that uh, suspects, predators have. And since I uh, left the DA's office two years ago, I have spent most of my time uh, trying to deal with what I consider to be one of the major stumbling blocks as to why many of these cases are not investigated and not prosecuted. It's called misconceptions. And there are many of them. And I just want to touch on a two or three. Uh, it, it all comes down to training uh, with the police and with prosecutor's offices. Um, for example, um, sometimes when a member of the public tries to make a report to the police department, they're being told time and time again, quote, it's just a civil matter not a crime and I always tell police officers you know you do a fantastic job in so many areas for which you're trained but what you're not trained to do is give people that response because you're not lawyers and it shouldn't be a police officer who does that it should be a trained deputy district attorney uh, and for example this afternoon we've had Josie on the line giving her question about a friend who feels that his son tricked him into signing a power of attorney and the fact is that that son has taken over all his property. Well, to me, that sounds very much like a theft, a family theft, elder financial exploitation. The problem is because there's a power of attorney, if anyone tries to make a police report, the police will often say, well, there's a power of attorney involved. It's just a civil matter. No. Secondly, a misconception. And unfortunately, I have to disagree with Mitch because many police officers, and Mitch recited it, says elderly victims don't make good witnesses. In my 22 years of prosecution, I can honestly tell you that so many, most of my elderly victims made phenomenal witnesses in the courtroom in front of a jury. And just because they might have had early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, did not make a difference. In fact, it gave them even more jury appeal. So we should not um, make that kind of uh, sweeping statement about uh, victims. Uh, thirdly, victims shouldn't get to choose which cases get prosecuted. Unfortunately, police often will ask a victim, do you want us to prosecute your son? And the victim will look down and go, well, I guess not. And the police close the case. Uh, and that's not appropriate. Uh, so uh, should victims get to uh, choose? No. Uh, again, it's all about training. And, and finally, I would say that there's ways to establish lack of consent. You know, sometimes we look at elder financial exploitation in, in very narrow, streamlined ways, and we shouldn't do that. There are so many different ways that people can take advantage, uh, undue influence, that Carol mentioned is one of them way. Another thing besides training about misconceptions is adopting a multidisciplinary team approach. And we've already heard about the financial abuse specialist teams. That is a fantastic way of getting people involved. And we need to get the federal prosecutors more involved as elder justice coordinators in our jurisdictions. So I'm so thankful that we have banks, credit unions, prosecutors, APS, psychiatrists, uh, and other folks involved in looking at these cases. Uh, one other point I want to make is this, that um, I know Lisa Nirenberg mentioned this, and unfortunately too many prosecutors do look at the amount that is lost. Um, as a prosecutor, I never really tried to look at the amount because I've learned over the many years that to one person, a widow who's 93, who has just been ripped off $750, to her that is everything. And the devastation it can cause to her is as much as somebody else who is a wealthy investor who's been ripped off $750,000. So even if there is no actual loss, I want to prosecute the conduct of the perpetrator, and that's called an attempted theft. Because if we don't prosecute, we're sending a loud signal to suspects, I got away with it, and I can do it again. And that's why we get people like Daniel from Sherman Oaks on the phone who is frustrated about, quote, the system. He says that the Burbank police were unable to help, the DA didn't help. And this 
it's what we've got to change the mindset sometimes of law enforcement or prosecutors because we need to do more. The reason that that probably that suspect moved on the, his sister, Daniel's sister, was because she was bipolar. And these suspects will pick somebody who has diminished mental abilities possibly or has got things that maybe can look bad to prosecutors or weak to prosecutors or to police officers. So there's a lot more that we can do, but I am optimistic because today is a demonstration that when you have a state treasurer, when you have an assembly member, you have members of this panel and you have a thousand people tuning in, there's so much more that we can do together to put it right and help protect the lives of our elders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul and Carol. Well, let's take a question from um, Lonnie, who, Lonnie, who's with us in Stockton. Hello, Lonnie, are you on? It's Linda. Uh, my apologies, Linda. Uh, thank you for being with us. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Um, my mother is uh, 89 years old. She has her grandson living on the property, and he is taking her money. We've tried to stop it. She is in the early stages of dementia, and every time we try to intervene, she backs down and says, no, she gave him her bank card. It's okay. She doesn't want nothing done. When can we overstep her wishes and do something and remove him from the property and put a stop to him? Thank you very much for that question, Lonnie, and I'm sorry to hear what um, is happening with um, your family. Uh, Paul, can I turn to you and to Carol and see what uh, advice you can provide? Sure. Well, I always let APS go first. So, Carol, why don't you go first and then I'll follow up. Well, it's a pretty complicated uh, situation you have there. And one of the things I would ask about is her executive functioning or her cognitive functioning. Um, and then I would ask a little bit about power of attorney. Does anybody have the ability to kind of oversight mom's account, oversight what's happening in that, in that regard? There's a lot of times where we want to take a soft approach to how we are speaking with our folks and kind of just building that rapport and working towards a viable solution with um, maybe, mom, you know, we're really worried. How do we manage um, to kind of keep you protected while you continue to maintain your relationship um, with this relative? I think it's really hard to kind of come in and be very aggressive um, when there's that familiar relationship. Thank you. Paul, can you weigh in before we move to our next person? Sure. Uh, well, Linda, this is what I would suggest. I would suggest that you do make a report to your local police department. And even though this may be against grandma's wishes, it is important, I think, to lay the foundation for an investigation. Uh, certainly, um, just because somebody has early stages of dementia doesn't mean that they do not still have the ability and the legal right to say where they want their money to go. But it sounds like um, she is being clearly manipulated and unduly influenced, uh, if not more. And I, if I were a police officer, I would want to know what is the grandson using that money for? Is he simply using it for his own benefit or is he also using it for the benefit of his grandmother? Probably not. Um, certainly, there are many times when we would uh, encourage police to investigate exactly that kind of case. And when an investigation is done and when questions are asked and when light is shed upon this whole situation, it's amazing sometimes uh, how clear it can become that this potentially is an elder financial exploitation case that should be prosecuted and hopefully the money, if it's not already gone on drugs or alcohol or gambling, can be uh, retrieved or at least partially um, recovered. So I would certainly urge you, Linda, to consider uh, calling the police and hoping that they will not just say it's a family matter or it's a civil matter. Thank you very much, Paul. Our next question comes from Katie. Hello, Katie, are you with us? Kathy. Hello, Katie. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Kathy, are you 
you. Hi. Please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, I actually shared one of the testimonials. And I guess um, my story is perhaps a, somewhat bizarre in that my father um, married again in the 10th decade of his life. And so pretty much everything that occurred um, was shielded by this um, marriage. You know, so everything was happening kind of behind the scenes of an elderly marriage. Everything was excused or permitted um, as his free will, you know, within the context of, and, you know, late in last marriage. Um, so I was just interested in what Paul had to say about, um, you know, kind of getting the attention of the authorities because I did go through all the normal channels. Um, I did report um, to the ombudsman, to the DA's office, to APS, and all across the board, even though my father had, you know, worsening dementia, um, he was considered to have, you know, enough capacity to pretty much give full control to the new wife's daughter. Um, and so, you know, every attempt I made to kind of, you know, protect him because he was losing control of um, you know, his estate was pretty much repudiated. So my question is, how do we, you know, get beyond this, these barriers, you know, these appearances of well, this is what the elder wants versus what's really happening. Thank you very much for well, that Kathy. question. I'm sorry to hear what's going let, um, let, let me do this. Um, I really would also like to hear from Lisa. Uh, perhaps she can also weigh in on this. But let's start off with you, Paul, if you want to um, um, give some advice to Kathy, and then we'll also hear from Lisa. Please go ahead. Thank you. Kathy, I mean, you, I think you summarized it very well. How do we get beyond the barriers? And, and my advice to people is, is very consistent. Um, if you've come across a roadblock with the police or with other uh, agencies, I would suggest writing a letter, very short, to the point, bullet points, um, be very polite, respectful, uh, be very truthful, um, but just set out why you believe that this case should be investigated, uh, whether uh, it can also involve a multidisciplinary team approach involving medical personnel in the jurisdiction where this is occurring. Because I have found in my 25 years as a prosecutor, what cases that were languishing got action were those in which people took the time to write a letter to the chief, to the elected DA, and to the police chief. Those uh, people got responses. So that's what I would suggest. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Lisa, are you still on with us? You care to weigh in? Uh, I still am on, and yeah, I would just make uh, a point that, you know, these cases often take um, some real finessing and some real creativity on the part of who's working with the victim to really understand, you know, what they want and what their motivations are, um, to to really focus in on, you know, why a person um, may be afraid of taking action. There's certainly a lot of reasons why we'd have hesitations. I think that kind of speaks to why it's so important to have services like the, like a support group or uh, simply counseling to work with somebody to really walk through with them, you know, what the problem is and, and what, what will happen if they take actions. I think sometimes we assume that somebody knows what's going to happen if they make a police report and maybe they don't know what, what the outcome is going to be. It, um, so, you know, we do a lot of training with people that, with advocates that work with victims to help them, you know, really uh, take the time and walk through to talk to people about what their options are, what help is there, you know, who in the family might be able to surprise, provide support to the person um, to help them through a difficult situation. But every case is different, and, you know, that's why the adult protective services and the different uh, professionals out there and the multidisciplinary teams are so important to be able to have people that can look at this from different angles and offer options that hopefully may be acceptable to the to the older person and if it's at the point where 
somebody needs to intervene and take control for them, that that's done in a fair way and with transparency and accountability. Thank you very much for that, um, for that, Lisa. I just want our listeners to know that if you do want to talk to someone to um, to help you figure out if um, what you are experiencing, whether you've been defrauded or not, or you want help to determine how to report a fraud or a scam, please feel free to always call the AARP Fraud Watch helpline, which you can reach on 877-908-3360. Again, that number is 877-908-3360. And um, you can talk to somebody there who can um, help you assess your particular, particular situation. As we near the end of our call, I'd just like to give each of our, our guests today a chance to follow up on um, any comments or questions that they heard today or share any share their closing remarks or any additional resources. Let's um, start off um, with our California treasurer, uh, Fiona Ma, and then um, Assembly Member Missouri. Thank you, Strat, so much. And I just want to thank all of the experts uh, who uh, took their time to show up today. It was an amazing town hall, and I know my dad and I learned a lot. He took many notes. He's sitting across from me, as, as I uh, said at the beginning. I'd also like to thank my external affairs team, led by Gloria Lee, but especially Noah Starr, who was instrumental in making today happen, as well as Donnie, Dr. Bonnie Olson, Vice Chair of Research for Family Medicine at USC Keck School of Medicine. The testimonials and the audio recording will be on my website at www.treasure.ca.gov. And if you look on the right side of my website, go down to the link that says in the community, and you will find all of the testimonials um, uh, listed there as well as the audio recording when it is available. I also have resource guides that are updated on a real-time basis. So if you go to my website and you click on the COVID-19 resource guides, you will see a link for senior resources. And again, these are federal, state, local, and private uh, resources, loans, grants, and helpful um, information, phone numbers that you can use or pass on to others who may be looking for uh, programs and services and financial support. And again, if you have questions following this town hall, please feel free to email me at askfiona at treasure.ca.gov. Again, askfiona at treasure.ca.gov, and we will do the best to answer your questions or connect you to the representatives that can help you. So thank you all for your time today. Again, it was so information, so much information, and as all the speakers said, it is about awareness. We should not be embarrassed if this has happened to us or a family member. We should be sharing the information so that others are not duped or scammed. So again, thank you and stay safe. Thank you very much, Treasurer Ma. Unfortunately, Assembly Member Nazarian has had to go on to another course, so uh, we, we will apologize for that. So as we've reached the end of our Teletown Hall, I really want to say a special thank you to all the people behind the scenes who have helped to make this Teletown Hall possible, and to all of you for participating in this event. We apologize if uh, we weren't able to answer your question. However, if you stay on the line, you'll be able to leave us a voicemail with your question or comments. You can um, also obtain uh, some valuable information through AARP publications on our website at aarp.org backslash Fraudwatch Network, or as I said, calling our AARP Fraudwatch Network helpline at 877-908-3360. And lastly, I want to uh, give a very special thanks to our guests for today, um, California State Treasurer, Treasurer Ma, Assembly Member Jen Nazarian, Lisa Nuremberg with the California Elder Justice Coalition, Laura Sykes with the 
California Bankers Association, Mitch Friedman with the California Society of Public Accountants, Miki Nozaki of Senior Medicare Patrol, Carol Rose from the Sacramento County's Adult Protective Services Financial Abuse Specialist Team, and former San Diego Deputy District Attorney Paul Greenwood. Thank you for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you, and this concludes today's Teletown Hall.